Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this round table, or no table, the round table without a table on the future of Russia. Uh, my name is Charles Grant from the Centre for European Reform in London. We've got five very distinguished panellists. Uh, we're going to hear from them all. Because we have only an hour for the whole session and many distinguished experts in the audience, uh, no speeches allowed, just a brief opening question from me to each of our panellists. Um, and then we'll have plenty of time for discussion from the floor. Now, if you want to put in a question, you can email to me on russia at wef.ch, or you can send a tweet to hash wef underscore Russia. And your comments will come in, and we'll take some of them. But you're allowed to stick up your hand the old-fashioned way if you prefer as well. Um, I think there's at least four questions I hope we touch on today. One is the politics with Putin's third term. What does that augur for political and economic reform in Russia? Um, does the recent chill in US-Russia relations matter? Uh, I think we need to talk about energy as well with the restructuring of the Russian energy industry recently announced. Uh, and the dip in the oil price. Let, let's talk a little bit about energy and whether a, a falling oil price is good or bad. Thirdly, we should talk about privatization because the government does, I believe, plan to privatize various things. Will this transform the economy? What, what will happen there? And finally, with Russia just entering the World Trade Organization, I think we should talk about the WTO and its impact on Russia. Um, I'm going to turn, first of all, to... Rustam Minikhanov, the president of Tatarstan, uh, and I'd like him to give us a, perhaps his thoughts on whether the return to power of Putin is good or bad for reform in Russia. What do you expect to see in terms of reform in Putin's third term? No, yeah, I'm going to Personally, express my personal opinion of a regional leader. What can we say? Vladimir Putin is a person with vast experience. He's already served two presidential terms and, of course, He's got a vast experience of managing his government. The fact that he is back as a president for the Republic of Tatarstan, and for me personally, this is a, an understandable person. He's a person we can read who sets clear tasks. We therefore welcome it. The Republic of Tatarstan supports Putin's policies. And many processes that are underway in the country at large touch upon our republic, and that's all thanks to the relationship between us and all thanks to President Putin's attitude towards Tatarstan. We have large scale projects. The Republic of Tatarstan is one of the most dynamically developing regions, and all our initiatives, petrochemicals, oil refining, the new oil refining complex we have commissioned, were supported by federal leadership of Russia. The World Student Games that are due to take place in Kazan, the World Cup in the, in, the, in, the, in the 2015 and 2017, Kazan is part of all these huge undertakings, and of course Putin's part in that is huge. I don't know. People have different attitudes to Mr. Putin. They paint him in different colors, but my personal relationship with him, my personal Meetings with him show that he's a, he's a man I can read, he speaks clearly, and he does what he says. He is a man who wants to change our country, he wants our country to be powerful, stronger. We, of course, join him in these wishes and endeavors. We therefore support Putin's policies. Thank you very much. 
Let me turn now to Elena Popova. You work for an NGO in Moscow. You probably have a slightly different view of Putin's return. But as you're, you're part of civil society, tell us, do you think that civil society has the potential to change Russia? And also, you know, the, the small enterprise sector well. Do you think small companies can do a lot to transform Russia? Yeah, my point of view is that the huge question is not who, but why. And the answer is that we got a new civil society, and we got you know a lot of crowdsourcing, crowdfunding projects, and we can help each other. And this is a huge, huge reaction on the Putin selections. And I didn't get any any words about who is Mr. Putin, why is Mr. Putin, and so on and so forth. The main question is the economy of my country. I am there. I work there. I didn't emigrate to any other country. I have my own business there. I have the virtual incubator for women and startups, and this is the hugest one in Russia. I have a virtual incubator for social entrepreneurships, and I can develop all this stuff. But the main question is that we should destroy all this corruption structure at all with the help of small enterprises. That's why we should you know, decrease but not increase taxes we should help uh, with the credit, uh, credits for them. We should help with um, good, good promotional sphere for them. Okay, thank you. L let me turn now to Andrei Kostin, the boss of one of the biggest banks in Russia. Um, the Russian economy famously is quite unbalanced. Uh, it's very dependent on natural resource exports, needs to do more to develop service industries, manufacturing, and your, your bank obviously will play an important part in rebalancing Russia. How significant do you think are the privatization uh, programs that the Russian government has announced? Will they transform Russia? Are you optimistic about their potential? Well, I think it's extremely important, uh, though it will not solve all the problems of Russian economy, and uh, including the problem of modernization. Uh, but uh, privatization is very high on the agenda for Medvedev, personally, for Medvedev government. And uh, actually later this week, uh, the Russian cabinet will meet to decide the uh, exact timetable for further privatization. Uh, it uh, looks like that we expect quite a broad privatization. Uh, there's uh, about 850 uh, companies on the list, uh, but there's a very short, there's a couple of issues which arise from uh, this problem. First of all, how this privatization is to be done. Because we had a bad experience in the in 90s when uh, so-called uh, culturalized auctions or whatsoever uh, provided the um, uh, ownership to a very specific groups uh, of businessmen in Russia without paying, mu without paying much for this. Uh, definitely there is a uh, a number of influential businessmen in Russia who would like uh, to repeat this, and I think that will be uh, uh, extremely wrong for Russia if privatization goes this way. I think the main government understands the importance of how transparent uh, and open privatization process, which will include the foreign investors. Secondly, of course, there will be an opposition uh, to this process. We already see that uh, certain influential members um, of business community also are trying to um, postpone the privatization in certain areas like energy sector, for example. And the third, of course, that the market is not very favorable for privatization today. As we see, uh, there is a lot of problems for many companies to be listed uh, in the market today. So I think we also sh uh, should take into account how much we can sell. But uh, coming back to, the, to my first statement, yes, the privatization is very important. There is a leading companies uh, on the list, uh, including VTB, which the government announced uh, ready to sell up to 100% uh, stake. Uh, it includes other blue chip companies in Russia. So the answer is yes, I think it's very important for Russian economy. Though again, it will not resolve all the issue, but will be a, a, a very big step toward the right direction. Right, let me turn now to Fatty Birol, the chief economist of the uh, uh, International Energy Agency. Um, um, International Energy Agency. Uh, Fatty, we, we've, we've heard about privatization, but another part of the Russian government's agenda is to restructure the energy industry. We, we've had some signs of, of that. Uh, how significant do you think that will be? And more generally, do you think the falling oil price is um, good news for Russia because it might force it to take some of the 
structural reforms that it's been avoiding? Was it bad news because it, it'll make it harder to fund the budget? Thank you. First of all, I don't think that the prices are uh, fallen. They are 99. Okay. It may be low for Russia, but very high for Turkey. I can yes. tell you that. Yes. Or for many consuming uh, yes. uh, countries. Now, the structural problem for Russia is, and I don't think that the Russian uh, policymakers take it so seriously, unfortunately, it is very much relying on energy revenues. Uh, this year, with the current prices, uh, Russia will make a handsome 400 billion US dollar from oil and gas import bills, which is about 25% uh, of the GDP. I know that the uh, Russian uh, uh, president uh, recently made a statement, similar to uh, previous statements, that they want to diversify the economy. Mm -hmm. This will be very wise, and if it is implemented, of course. And there are two major risks today to justify why diversification, diversification is important for Russia. One, currently Europe, the main customer of Russia in terms of gas, is going through very difficult times in terms of economy, and European gas demand in the year 2011 is a result of the uh, low economic performance declined about 10% and went back to the level of 2000, 10 years back. So there is no gas demand. And therefore, the exports from Russia, which is the, again the, the main customer is Europe, uh, is affected from that. Mm -hmm. this, is, and this means if the, uh, there is a, a vulnerability for uh, Russia vis-a-vis -vis the economies of the others. This is the one structural problem. Second, more importantly, a key topic which is being discussed in this forum since the, uh, yesterday, in fact, the private uh, 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 part of the uh, forum, there is a shale gas, unconventional gas revolution taking place in many countries in the world, <coughs> in US, China, Australia, and there are new competitors with substantial amount of gas export uh, potential are coming. New Russias are coming with different type of uh, gas so therefore, the, the market for Russia may be tightened, and there will be a pressure on Russia as it, is, it will not be the only uh, dominator in terms of the gas markets. So this, again, highlights the vulnerability to the new technologies in the energy and to uh, put uh, Russia behind the uh, uh, queue. So these two elements uh, highlight that there is an uh, urgent need in Russia slowly but surely diversify its economy. This is the one point I wanted to make. And the second and the final point I want to make is that the, uh, you mentioned the modernization. In terms of energy, it means using energy more efficiently. Mm -hmm. And Russia today uses energy as inefficient as many sub-Saharan African countries' efficiency levels. Mm -hmm. So in order to produce one uh, glass, the amount of energy Russia uses is about five times the European use for the same glass, five times more energy. So therefore, Russia is putting, throwing a lot of money out of the window by, uh, by uh, investing the energy because of the, how the uh, technology is put in place, the regulations are rather poor and insufficient, mm. and the prices are highly subsidized mm. as a result of that. So I think uh, these two subjects for Russia at the energy front is at stake, namely restructuring the economy, go away from the energy, look at the other options, and second, uh, modernize the energy use and uh, use it more efficiently. Before I bring in Dennis, Moritz, Dennis Moritzov, let me just turn back to Mr. Minikarnov, the president of Tatarstan. Having heard what <laughs> Fatih Birol has just said, um, do you think in your Republic, you can do more to promote energy efficiency. Are you worried at how inefficiently, uh, perhaps in your republic, like other parts of Russia, energy is used? What can be done? Are prices too low? Will your, will your citizens in your republic be happy if prices are raised, as Mr. Birol says they should be? Well, 
To be honest, Russia does have a lot to do. It has to work very hard on its energy consumption. Not just en energy consumption, resource consumption has to be modernized. But you have to understand that we lived in a totally different political system. We had a totally different country. We had no problem with supplies of gas, oil, metal, etc. It was a plant economy and things just fell from heaven. Now today, in Tatarstan, starting from the year 2000, we've been adopting energy conservation programs and since then twice we have adopted energy and resource saving and efficiency programs. As our GDP grows, and I remind you it grew by 6, 7, 8 percent at the moment, our rate of growth is about 5 percent, but as we grew, our energy consumption has not increased. So this energy saving program has borne fruit, and we are managing to stay energy neutral with our growth. Another very important segment is residential sector and utilities. You cannot change it overnight. We need different standards in terms of heat conductivity, insulation, metering standards and systems. All of that takes time. In the last four years, we have refurbished 9,100 blocks of flats, and there's just half of what we need to refurbish to be more energy efficient. We cannot do it any quicker. From 32 trillion tons of oil that we produce, we refine only seven last year. We commissioned a new plant. It's become 14 million tons. So we don't just refine crude oil. We would like to reduce the risks. What we have decided for ourselves is that we'll expand petrochemical industry and there are many projects like that in Russia but you know in order to build a refinery it takes two, two years to design it three years to build it one year to commission it so five to six years it takes to build such a facility so there's a new standard now from 2015 our fuel oil will be taxed more severely, and that will mean that will incentivize deeper oil conversion, deeper refining, getting rid of these heavy, dirty products and going into lighter products. So Russia needs time. You know, uh, Russia is a behemoth. We cannot turn around in a moment from being communist. We cannot become market capitalists overnight. And we cannot revise and review everything overnight. Huge projects are under underway. We're building new residential uh, spaces, following new building standards. But that takes time. In terms of price for crude oil, <laughs> the price will be as it would be, it would never really fall. Shale, gas, and heavy bitumen oil will not reduce the price a lot because these are very, very costly industries, very costly technologies. The price for oil, traditional oil and gas, may call a little, fall a little bit, but not on any large scale. So we, for instance, we have huge deposits of bitumen oil, heavy oil. We're working on technologies to produce it. I think hydrocarbon resources of Russia are huge, and we have to be we have to be focusing on refining, on petrochemicals and refining, and we should really look at gas chemical industry. We should not depend on exports of natural gas so much. I agree with experts. We must be more active in developing gas chemi chemical uh, complexes. Thank, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> as you say, it'll take a long time to change Russia, but one thing that might speed up the change is the WTO. Denis Morozov, you're a, uh, the executive director at the uh, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. You've watched Russia um, uh, negotiate for 18 years before it decided finally to join the WTO. Is this going to help to speed up modernization, change, rebalancing within Russia, or should we not get too excited about it? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, first of all, this is true that it's not going to be very easy and fast to change Russia. And you're exactly right that it took us not 18, but like almost 19 years uh, to negotiate the term of the accession to the WTO 
and finally we are joining the club, right, after 19 years of negotiation. According to the Working Party report, which was approved uh, by the ministerial conference in December, Russia agreed to lower average tariff to 7.8% from current 10% as of June 2011. For manufactured goods, uh, the average import tariff will be cut from 9.5 to 7.3%. It was a big debate in Russia if it's good for Russia to join the WTO or not, because, of course, some industries and producers uh, will suffer for, actually, more competition. And uh, I would say that, first of all, Russia managed to negotiate uh, quite a good terms of uh, accession. First of all, tariffs would be uh, initially declined to mid-2007 level. And uh, anti-crisis protection for the sectors uh, is to be lifted. Russia managed to protect its most uh, vulnerable sectors, auto producers and agriculture, by uh, attaining seven and eight years uh, transition periods. Uh, uh, and uh, when we talk about, for example, insurance sector, insurance companies will be able to open 100% subsidiaries in Russia only after nine years from uh, Russia joining the WTO. So is it good or bad? Of course, my personal position, this is very good because Russia joining the WTO would uh, enhance competition and uh, reduce uh, the costs of imported goods, which is uh, immediately beneficial for Russian consumers and might promote industries uh, to modernize. It would also help Russia to improve its institutions. Mm -hmm. And first of all, when we talk about customs administration, it will be much more efficient. And Russia uh, has already agreed to reduce uh, um, uh, uh, custom clearance fees by almost two-thirds, I mean maximum custom clearance fees, and also in terms of government procurement, it will help a lot to build institutions. Also, clear rules on investment and uh, resolving trade disputes could stimulate investments in the midterm. And this uh, should be achieved uh, and uh, give quite significant uh, increase in GDP growth in the short term by 28%, mid-term by 3.3%, and in the long run by 11% according to the World Bank, and this should be achieved through the more efficient location of resources and greater competition. So, and I believe this is very good uh, and will help actually Russia to modernize and improve competition and uh, rebuild pu public institutions. So it's a very good achievement. Glad to hear such an optimistic view. Um, do your predictions for the benefits of WTO membership apply kind of whatever happens to governance in Russia, or are you working on the assumption that governance will improve? Yeah, first of all, I believe that governance will improve anyways, mm -hmm. because it's one of the implication of the current uh, stage of economic development of Russia. So Russia is in transition, as uh, you named this session, and this is absolutely correct, because first of all, Russia achieved a lot during the 20 years last 20 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a huge development since 91. Also, uh, Russia achieved a lot, coming back to the first question, if it's good or bad if Mr. Putin's coming back. First of all, he's not coming back because uh, he didn't leave. <laughs> he always uh, stayed there and he was pretty much engaged. Uh, but if you remember Russia, uh, how did it look like in the late 90s? Russia actually was on the edge of the collapse of the political collapse, mm -hmm. economic collapse. Russian government achieved a lot during the last 12 years, of course on the back of the increased commodities and oil gas prices, but in the meantime, Russian GDP doubled over the last 10 years. Russian middle class uh, increased significantly. And uh, right now we have a different agenda. And from my personal point of view, the fact that Russian middle class is increasing, the fact that people are getting much more engaged they want to be involved in the political process, and we saw that since uh, December 2011 elections, mm -hmm. this is a very good and positive development. And Russia is changing, Russia is changing economically, Russia is getting more independent and mature, and uh, it will uh, bring new agenda and new issues that Russian government will have to deal with. And I'm also very optimistic that Russian government will also have to introduce significant uh, political reforms in, in years to come, in order to comply with the current stage of the current country's development. Mm. Well, that's very interesting to hear that optimistic view. Before I bring in our other uh, panelists to, to see if they agree with you and your optimism, I have one tweet coming in from Bulent Chelebi. Is, is he with us? Is he? Yes, okay. Well, uh, I gather it's about the difficulties of importing products into Russia 
legally, and you want to know what's being done about this. I think it follows on from Mr. Morozov's comments on governance. Would you like to uh, explain your, your question? And is there a microphone for Can go to Mr. Mr. Chelebi? <laughs> I mean, uh, importing products into Russia, following the, you know, following the legal rules and the certifications and paying the tariffs and things like that. Um, uh, I mean, that's what we do, but our competitors don't, and they end up having a significant uh, cost advantage uh, uh, because of that. And I'm just kind of curious as to, you know, if there are any actions that are being taken to normalize uh, this, this all, uh, all the stuff, so that. We can all do uh, business in compliance with the, uh, with the uh, Russian laws. So your question is really what's being done to tackle corruption? That's part of your question. Yeah. Well, we don't have a spokesman. I, I can take this question, actually. OK, well, quickly, yes. yes. Yeah, first of all, it's quite yeah. difficult to comment because uh, I never imported goods in Russia illegally. Mm -hmm. So running two largest Russian companies before that, actually, we mm -hmm. always did it legally. So that's why it's quite difficult to comment. But yeah, first of all, joining the WTO, Russia will have to lift uh, certain, uh, um, uh, will have actually to improve customs administration. As I told, the maximum uh, customs fees will be decreased by two thirds. And uh, uh, as I remember, in March uh, this year, then President Medvedev signed anti-corruption plan for the next two years, for years uh, 2012 and 2013, introducing concrete measures that uh, should be achieved in order to decrease the level of corruption in Russia and also with regard to the customs regulations. Yeah, first of all, it will be like special education programs for customs officers. I don't know if it's going to help or not, but at least when people will be educated about it and when we, they will uh, have a clear understanding what applications are. This is actually good to hear. And also, as I remember, there are like certain concrete measures actually addressing these problems. And uh, okay. you can check it on the Kremlin website, basically. Okay, well, mm -hmm. very... May I, may I answer yes. to the, Yeah, you know, yes. the, main, the main question is that we don't have any rules because these rules are changing in the process. And this is a huge challenge for everybody because we don't understand how to play in this game. And this is a huge challenge for the whole economy because our economy isn't effective at all. And we should change a, ro a lot of things like to make it more transparent for everybody, to make it more understandable for the foreign players. And my huge questions are for foreign investors. So why are you not so active in, in Russia? What are you afraid of? So this is the main question for everybody. And we, we try to make our economy uh, uh, more effective for small businesses to develop uh, our own stuff inside the country, not outside the country. Okay, well, if, if there are people in the room who are foreign investors in Russia, we'd, we'd like to hear from them. But let me turn to Andre Kostin. Um, uh, we've, you've talked already about privatization. Do you think privatization in itself can help to improve governance, reduce opportunities for corruption, and do you... Do you see the gov Are you as optimistic as Mr. Morozov that the new government in Russia is really trying very hard to improve governance? Well, not necessarily, because what we see in uh, some Russian private companies or listed companies uh, with no government participation, uh, sometimes uh, much worse in corporate governance than in state-run uh, companies. So I think there's a question of general improvement uh, of uh, uh, corporate governance. Uh, on the other hand, I would like to say that um, in Russia, on one hand, we have too much state if we talk about the direct involvement in the economy. So the state owes uh, the banks and companies. On the other hand, I think what we definitely need to strengthen the mechanism of government regulations. Uh, you know, that's what works. Uh, I mean, in America, definitely, the um, anti-monopolist committee is much a stronger uh, vehicle um, uh, than in Russia. And, 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 and the same applies to, to other uh, Russian institutions. Uh, so uh, in Russia, the businessmen prefer to, uh, to find access to Mr. Putin and Mr. Medvedev to resolve this issue rather than go to the uh, whatever committee which exists. Uh, in Russia in order to strengthen his uh, case. So I think that should be definitely uh, improved, uh, that we should have 
privatized economy, but with a better regulation uh, on part of the government offices, which are, we should do it uh, in the proper way. Fassi Birol, what would be your advice to the Russian government on how to handle its energy industry? Uh, you, you observe energy industries all over the world. Um, you've seen that the government is planning to privatize parts of it, but there's some questions as to whether the state will really uh, lo loosen its grip or not. What, what would be your, your own advice to people in Russia? So there are many things that one could suggest the Russian government to consider, but I can perhaps uh, say two of them. Uh, the first one is, again, and the, I insist on this energy efficiency thing. I mean, this is not only an ide ideological thing. This is not for the environment, which is environment is very important, but let's, let's put it aside. It's a money story. It's a finance story. I mentioned that today Russia makes most of the revenues from uh, gas exports. And today Russia exports 180 BCM. Just put in my 180 units. If Russia brings it is energy efficiency level technology in line with Europe, let's say UK, in 10 years of time, Russia would save at home 180 BCM on top of that. So it means Russia would double its gas exports without increasing the production. Mm -hmm. Just saving the wasteful energy at home and selling it outside. So this is a very simple mathematical economical uh, story. Save at home and uh, sell it outside. This is one. Second, Russia now has to develop new and more challenging uh, oil and gas fields. The new generation of the fields, including Arctic, will come in the picture. And this would need, according to our estimates, about 100 billion US dollars of uh, investment each year for oil and gas investments. And up to date new technologies because they are more challenging than the existing ones. Therefore, I do not think that Russia can bring this money, bring the technology only with the state owned or sta state directed industries. There is a need to get the uh, multiple players there uh, from outside of the country in line with the uh, Russia's uh, rules and regulations and the, any signal any wrong signal given to the private investors would be definitely in the medium term uh, getting back to Russia in terms of lack of investment, therefore not being able to increase the production. So I think it should be, uh, Russian uh, policymakers should be careful what kind of signals they are giving to the private investors in terms of uh, energy industry. You're implying that they're not giving entirely the right signals at the moment. I think there is a, a substantial room for improvement there. Right, right. I think you're probably right. Um, I'd like to encourage people to come up with some questions. Ah, we've suddenly got um, a whole load of questions. That's rather statements. No, those are statements. Uh, on questions no coming question. through to my machine, I've only got one. But people can either tweet, email, put up a hand, or give me a bit of paper. Uh, I'm going to bring in Lord Mandelson in a second into the debate uh, we have with us. And I gather there may be a Mr. Simono from GDF who would like to contribute. Do we have him in the room? No, maybe he's not in the room after all. Um, uh, so, time, time to put up your hands or to send a tweet if you'd like to ask a question. Um, oh, there's one, some, uh, is, that, is that the gentleman behind me who I can't see because he's behind me? Would you like to ask a question and introduce yourself? Thank you. The, um, the PEs, uh, PE ratios in Russia are less than half than in the rest of the industrial world. Is this being addressed? Is there any concern uh, to do measures to change this? OK, would you pass the microphone to Eric Bergloff from the EBRD? What do, what do you want to say? Uh, I thought you asked, wanted to ask a question. No, Sorry. No. Sorry, you don't. OK, in that case, we'll, we'll, there's a question, a question over here. Yes, please. Um, yes, um, I'm Gerard Sussman from GDF Suez. I have one question for, for the lady. Um, you mentioned um, you are asking investors what what is it what problems they have. No, I'm I'm a business angel, so I invest my okay. own money in small businesses. So. I I understand. Um, there are some hidden obstacles we believe in certain fields, for instance, in the field of infrastructure uh, or water or energy efficiency, 
And those are the rules, the regulations, or the, the rules between the states and the federal government. Uh, and another one is the legal system and the protection of foreign investors. So these are two things that are not too much talked about, but that can make a very big difference because if you have to invest for the long pool, you need to have some stability uh, in the system. So I wonder if you, anyone could comment about that. Okay, well, well, we'll come back to our panel in a second. Let's take a few more uh, questions. There was the hand over here, and then we've got a few tweets coming in as well. Yeah. Uh, Roland Nash from uh, Verno Capital in, in Moscow. Uh, there's, there's one area where Russia is undoubtedly um, a world leader, and that is talking about reforms. Uh, we've been talking about reforms for the last uh, 15 years, and not only that, we've been talking about the same reforms, uh, diversification away from energy, uh, privatization, uh, and so forth. We, we have a new government in Russia now, and I think actually a pretty good government, does the panel think that this time around it's going to be different and we'll move on from talking about reforms to actually implementing some of these really quite difficult reforms? That is the key question. Let's take one more point from Lord, Lord Mandelson. Would you like to, uh, as a former trade commissioner who dealt with Russia a lot, perhaps you have a particular view on whether WTO membership will really make a difference or not. Let's hear your view. I think that once Russia is in the WTO and operating as a normal member of the WTO, over time, and I mean over uh, years, uh, there will be a very positive, beneficial uh, process uh, for Russia. I think Russia uh, will reap huge advantages, not because there are going to be events or that people can sort of push buttons and pull levers and sort of see uh, dramatic changes happening overnight. But by means of a process, um, uh, progressively, Russia's economy uh, and its trading um, links uh, and the investment will all be normalized. And I think normalization of Russia's economy uh, the way in which its uh, markets operate, the way in which the state should be, play less of a role, uh, not that the state should play no role, there should be a sort of more normal mixed economy uh, operating uh, in Russia in the way that it does uh, in, 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 in the rest of Europe. But I think Russia also has to be very conscious, and you may have touched on this, Charles, uh, before I came, and I'm sorry I wasn't here at the beginning of the discussion, but when uh, TNK, BP, sort of erupts all over uh, uh, again, I think Russia has to be deeply conscious of the impact uh, uh, this sort of behavior has on the international investor uh, uh, community. Um, it suggests that an international in investment in Russia will not take place or operate or enter or exit in a normal way. And where there are not normal conditions and normal rules and uh, normal conditions of behavior operating, confidence uh, will, uh, uh, will, will drop. And uh, as members of the panel have already indicated, in an area like the energy sector, uh, but there are other uh, uh, natural resource and uh, related sectors where Russia's potential is absolutely huge, but where it needs international investment, technologies, uh, management expertise to come in and help realize that potential. What, what sort of signal is given uh, to the international investor community uh, when we see the sorts of actions and behavior uh, of, uh, of, of, of the Russian side, of these individuals who I think are acting um, uh, not only in a way that is sort of completely le sort of unconducive to any sort of normal good commercial business investment relationship with a company like BP, I think they're doing colossal damage to their own country, to Russia itself because of what it represents and the message it, 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 it sends. So I'd be interested in the panel's views on that. Okay, well, that's a lot of questions we've had coming in. Uh, and I don't have the tweets. Oh, they've finally come through on my small screen. We've got a few tweets as well. Let's start off with the questions we just had. One on PE ratios, one on the obstacles to, um, to investment in SMEs, uh, one on, uh, from Roland Nash, 
will the new government be really serious about implementing reform? And then Peter Mandelson's warnings on uh, Russia not treating foreign investors in a normal way. Um, let's start on my right and work around the table. Um, Dennis. Yeah, maybe just a few quick comments. On volition of the Russian companies, we are where we are. And uh, this is the uh, outcome of like number of problems that we have today. Yeah, first of all, and the biggest problem from my personal point of view is uh, a very uh, little diversification of the Russian economy. As uh, Mr. Birrell said, over 61% of Russian export revenues came from oil and gas sector last year. So that's why Russian economy is not diversified and it's very vulnerable. And what we saw uh, during the last couple of weeks when the oil price dropped from $115 per barrel to $100, Russian ruble depreciated uh, against American dollar by, I believe, 14 percent, and Russian uh, stock market collapsed by almost like 25 percent. And uh, the biggest question is like, why still producers or the largest banks suffered from it? Because like the whole Russian economy is so much dependent on oil and gas revenue that it really affects overall business climate in Russia and overall valuation of the Russian company. So first of all, we have to diversify. Uh, second, uh, definitely we have to improve corporate governance. And uh, of course, like Russia has to introduce better practices in order to treat uh, foreign investors be better than it does right now. But also, as Mr. Koytistin said, a number of Russian companies and private companies stationed with the corporate governance is even worse than in state companies. And uh, for example, I used to work for many years for, for Naris Knikel. And today, when uh, Mr. Patanin, with all uh, my respect, is uh, chairing the National Corporate Governance Council, and in the meantime, everyone knows what is going on in Naris Knikel, maybe uh, it's a bad signal for investor community how uh, Russia uh, seriously uh, taking this issue. On Mr. Madelson's comment, uh, introducing bad practices, I would also argue that uh, when BP decided to do uh, the transaction with Rosneft, they probably didn't read the stock uh, shareholders agreement first, right? And they just decided to go to the Russian government to make a deal without uh, respecting the rights of the uh, Russian shareholders and partners. And basically, this is exactly the practices that foreign investors sometimes introducing on the Russian market. So it's not mm -hmm. like uh, black and white, and it's a uh, two-way street, okay. I would put in this way. So. Okay, BP's not perfect. Elena. Yeah, yeah, I should answer firstly for that question, because yeah, I totally agree that our government talks a lot, but never like act like that. And this is the thing that we should, should change with the dialogue with the civil society, small businesses, enterprises, investors, foreign investors. And this is a huge question, how can we build this bridge between myself, my government, and you, for example? Because you as me, I live in my country, but you live outside, and we need to build, you know, a huge economy, like inside country, outside country, and earn a lot of money, because our family would like to eat a lot. <laughs> and this is a huge question. And uh, the second thing is that a good signal is that a lot of people start to talk a lot uh, about legal systems. and it, it's not about, you know, just legal system at all. It's all about how it works. So now it doesn't work. And we should act like we know the laws and we know how to act like according to these laws. And we should start from ourselves, firstly, I think so. And now is a good signal. Please come to me and we can have a dialogue. And I have a dialogue with our, our government, with our civil society, with small businesses. And maybe in, in this case, we can influence on some processes inside my country. But uh, yeah, the, th the third thing is that I, I'm sure that our government now is a technical thing. Uh, it's not about the personalities. It's about the whole structure. And the whole structure is an old structure. And the modern world should influence on what, how we change it, the change, you know, the um, diversification of economy, the change the dialogue, the change the, you know, principles of our economy at all. 
And this is a structure, not about like uh, certain surnames. So I think I will start corporate governance, not only corporate governance, corporate governance but also the governments uh, on the level of the state uh, and also of the municipal um, power. This is also a huge gap. And uh, we have to admit that we have to educate people. We should not just call this as a new system of uh, governance. We have to educate people. And we have the whole program. Uh, where, together with the government, uh, we decided to teach people. And also, we have the corporate programs, and we use uh, here the experience of Singapore. And we have agreement with Singapore. So that's why this process is a very long-term pro process. If somebody thinks that uh, today we talk about this and tomorrow we already have the effective system of uh, governance, this is not the case. Uh, we have to teach our youngsters for them to be integrated into the uh, world community, for them to know English language. And in this uh, regard, I think that uh, we're, uh, in the case uh, we have uh, the wish, uh, we will have improvement, but uh, this needs time. We, with regard to the small and medium enterprises, we have to understand uh, why, uh, yes, um, small and medium enterprises means middle class, but uh, we always were saying that uh, to be rich is a bad thing. And, uh, so that's why just to change mentality of people and to make people to be owners, this is not just easy task. And uh, I, uh, I'm speaking in real terms now, yes, for instance, uh, the 26% of our population lives in rural areas. So that's why uh, for them uh, to get credits, it means uh, that we have to explain them that this is a good thing for this process to start. And secondly, each forms of economy, uh, I'm talking about the family uh, farms, or I'm talking about the small and medium enterprises, how to become entrepreneur. Maybe in the West uh, this is simple, but if you're, you were not being taught in the school on this, if you were not being taught in university on this, if you do not have any uh, knowledge on this, how to do this, how to become entrepreneur? So state uh, should stimulate this. For instance, I applied to the bank, and uh, my uh, friend uh, uh, can help me, but uh, with some other citizens, uh, they could not be able to get this help. So that's why we have to establish industrial uh, parks, techno parks, and this should be not only the state policy. We have to change mentality. We have to increase awareness of people. Uh, we should not uh, bring fish to the table of citizens, but we have to change them how to uh, uh, catch a fish. So the process is very slow. With regard to the WTO, of course, uh, this uh, would be the huge challenge. But without this, uh, this is not possible. Because we have to, to understand that uh, more we go, uh, less we get. Um, when 153 countries, if I'm not mistaken, are members of the WTO, and they are uh, benefiting on, on this, why Russia should not uh, get these benefits? And we have to, uh, we have to, you know, pass this uh, through, and then we will be the full-pledged uh, um, members. I forgot the last question. Well, I'll give you a chance okay. to come back later. So you, you, you can talk, answer it later if you remember it. Um, Andre Kostin, uh, perhaps you should answer the question on why PE ratios are so low in Russia, but you may want to ask, answer some of the other questions as well. Yeah, well, I mean, I, answering the question about reforms, I think the problem yes. is that yeah. when things are good, nobody needs reforms. Yeah. When things are bad, there's a much more urgent things on the agenda rather than reforms. Uh, I think it will be extremely important that Russia will not miss the chance, uh, particularly if the economy improves, global economy, and there will be a better time for reforms. Uh, and I think that uh, if 60 percent of what the Russian government is now thinking of achieving uh, is achieved, I think it will be a very good result uh, for Russian economy. I think it's vital. Vital modernization is vital. Uh, what my colleagues said about uh, changing the nature of the economy, of less dependence on energy. I mean, that is, a, that is the vital, absolutely, question for Russian economy. And I think uh, both Putin and Medvedev uh, understand this uh, necessity, whether they'll be able to um, realize this program. I mean, we have to see. Uh, we here, of course, very much hope that they will be, or Putin will be in a position to do this, and he will... Uh, have enough, um, I would say, political intuition 
to understand uh, that his future also depends on how successful uh, the reforms are. Um, uh, so basically, I think that is a, that is a key issue for Russia. Um, for other issues, uh, you know, in the um, investments, well, I think there's many things which create problems for investments. Uh, some of them I were mentioned. I think still um, investors are overheated on other BRIC countries and I think uh, underestimated the opportunities in Russia. I think there is probably too uh, many concerns which do not exist. On the other hand, we have the same list of problems like corruption, like red tape, like others which unfortunately are not resolved and I agree with the person who just raised this issue that we were talking a lot uh, even within the context of Davos on this subject but we're doing much, uh, much uh, less. And I think here also um, that's the focus for, 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 for government, that's a focus for, uh, for, for the agenda of Mr. Putin for his third term. Fatty Birol, perhaps you have a comment on Peter Mandelson's statement or any other point you want to pick up? Two things. Um, one, our colleague mentioned that the, the uh, complaint that the Russian government talks about reforms but uh, never implements them. So I, I work with uh, many governments in the world. So just to tell him that Russia is not the only country in the world. So there are many <laughs> countries like that in the world. So you, you can be relaxed on, on that side. Um, Coming on the energy issue, I think this is a very serious an energy investment, a very serious issue for Russia. Uh, today, Russia is and will remain the cornerstone of the world energy system. Huge oil, gas, coal, hydropower, uranium resources. But to have the resources doesn't mean anything if you don't get the right investment, right time and develop those resources. And in Russia, there is one danger. You don't need to be energy expert here, but energy, the oil and gas fields are like human beings. They are very productive in the beginning of their lifetime. They come to a peak and then slow down and they decline their production. So very strong in the beginning, plateau, and then declines. In Russia, many of the major gas fields are in decline now. And in order to compensate that decline and increase the production, Russia needs huge new generation of development of oil and gas fields, and this requires huge amount of investment, 100 billion per year, and second, new technologies to be in place because these new fields are much more challenging geologically compared to previous ones. And yet, I believe recent developments show that the Russian government doesn't give the right signal to the private investors to come and invest in the, in the country and at the end of the day, this may well turn out to be a, a many investments are deferred, which is a bad news for the country's exports and production and therefore the revenues picture. So uh, I think there is a need uh, to pay more attention to how to treat the investments, especially in the energy sector. Thank you. Now, I know Dennis wants to come in. I'll bring you in now. Then I've got a couple of tweets about China. But firstly, Dennis. Yeah, just very quick comments. Uh, there was a question about uh, whether regional uh, authorities have an opportunity to improve uh, investment climate and to attract investments. Yes, indeed. And Yilabuga, for example, is one of the best examples because we support foreign investments and also in the uh, Tatarstan region. And uh, Yilabuga is the case. So where foreign investors want to invest. From talking to doing, uh, I personally believe that uh, there are many professional people in the current government. And uh, one uh, is coming from also Tatarstan, Nikolai Nikiforov. I know that he did a lot in Tatarstan. Seriously, he's very young, he's very passionate, he's very engaged. But also, he did a lot. So I saw it myself, and I believe that he will be able to implement uh, the same what he did in uh, Tatarstan and Kazan on a federal level, and uh, I'm really looking forward to it, right? And also the final question of relation of the Russian companies, we also have to keep in mind the current macroeconomic environment, all these bad expectations that we have today, and uh, how we can talk about relation of the Russian companies when 10 years treasury yield is like how many, it's two and a half percent, right? Of course, like, investors are pulling out money out of the emerging markets, actually, and are taking them to the safe heavens. So this all also implies and uh, affects the valuation of the Russian companies. Thank you.
Okay, we've got time for a couple of final questions. Uh, a tweet from Neil Hardwick. Given the difficulties some investors face in Russia, do the panel believe that future investment monies are more likely to come from countries with similar market structures like China? And then uh, Todd22, whoever he or she is, says, wasn't China's successive liberalization the better approach than Russia's overnight democratization? And uh, 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 Daria behind me, you want to ask a question? Yes, uh, microphone please, the lady behind me. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Daria. I'm representing Moscow Hub of Global Shapers. I just wanted to make my, uh, one uh, observation. I've been participating to several forums and sometimes it's seen that Russia is just, uh, some topics regarding Russia are discussed in like uh, several sessions. For instance, today I've been to like huge major topics uh, regarding the corruption and uh, regarding the building financial center. I was, and I was so surprised that like no seniors were there. Like ru no Russian seniors were there. And uh, I'm not blaming anybody. I'm just uh, wanted to send the message that like we are Russians who studied abroad, who came back to our country really uh, ready to do our best to promote our country, to share our experience with uh, our generation, uh, like with our peers, I would say, abroad. Just okay. take it from here. Okay. If the gentleman next to you wants to keep to 20 seconds, you're welcome to have the floor very quickly. Well, it's very difficult. Armin Sarkisian, former Armenian prime minister. Yes. Uh, I would like to, two things. One uh, related about uh, the, the recent stories with TNK and loaned old stories with TNK, BP, and so on and so forth. I have a, uh, I have a feeling that at the end of the day, there is something which is, I will call it, magnifying coefficient to Russia on the PR. Whatever happens in Russia is a little bit magnified, especially if it's a bit negative one in the world press somehow. The same time parallel what's happening, the sales of the shares, we saw what happened with the share price of Facebook. But nobody interpreted that in a dramatic or huge corruption or bad or something philosophical. So who can change, reduce this magnifying coefficient from 10 to 1, then Russia becomes a normal country? I think only Russians can do that. I think Russia is missing a huge opportunity of representing, presenting, and talking to the world and telling the right story. That's number one. Number two, another 20 seconds. I think for me, Russia is not half full or half empty glass, like here, the one you have here. It's half full, but with a great potential to become full, fully full. There are many uh, directions in several sectors that can repeat the success of a country like Turkey. Ten years ago, nobody will believe, 15 years ago, that this country will be, have a huge boom. N a lot of people ignored the industrial potential of this country. What has, has changed? I think what came to this country is law and order, dynamism, and openness to the world. And I wish this to Russia as well. Thank you very much. No, we've run out of time, but I'd like to give our panelists just one sentence each to, to let's go in reverse order. Um, Fatty Birol, last sentence from you. A, if I have to pick one line, I would like to see that uh, Russia will develop its natural resources, energy resources, in a timely manner for the benefit of its own economy, own people, but also for the rest of the world. And to do this, Russia needs to attack investments in a bad way, very quickly. It needs $100 okay. billion dollar per year. Full stop. Okay. Just Andre worth Austin. answering the question you raised. I mean, whether investment from China and other countries like Gulf will come to Russia, the answer is yes. Whether Russia can repeat the Chinese model, the answer is no. Okay. President. No, uh, I want to say that we have to be more open, and uh, this is a chance uh, to bring investors, and we are dealing with this now, actually. Yeah, I'm sure that Russia should be presented like in the foreign markets uh, with the face of young people, not 55 plus, 
because I'm so sorry. No, I'm so sorry, but it's true. If you would like to change anything, we should be presented by young people uh, up to, you know, 25 years old because they can change a lot. They live the real life and they suffer a lot from the structure, from the systems, from the credits and so on and so forth. And they are the owners of the small enterprises. And this, this is my real life. Thank you. Dennis. For men, 55 is just for women, 25, I think. <laughs> so it's the balance. <laughs> Yeah, also I should say that, first of all, I'm very positive. Definitely Russia is in transition. We have great opportunities and we have a lot of room to improve. But uh, we have really good Russian government and uh, when Alena is saying that Russia is not represented by young people, the same Nikolai Nikiforov, Minister for Information and Technology, is 29 years old and still he has done already in Tatarstan a lot. Mr. Dvarkovich is only 40 who is Deputy Prime Minister. Alexander Novak, Minister of Foreign Energy, is 41. So we have very young, intellectual people who are very good professionals working in the Russian government right now who understand not only the problems that we have, but also they know how to overcome them and make our life better. So I'm very positive and I'm looking forward to big changes. Well, I'm glad to, to finish on a positive note. Thank you to all our panelists for a lively, constructive discussion.